All right, I'll share my screen. Good. It's half past six. Let's be Swiss and punctual, right? Welcome, uh, Professor Friedman, on this uh, Regident webinar tonight. Um, extremely excited uh, of uh, this third uh, session with you, uh, mini series, as we say today. Uh, not Netflix, but almost. <laughs> so, um, Tonight, the topic is the um, adjunctive potential of using uh, hyaluronic acid in uh, regenerating periodontal tissues. Um, on the previous session, uh, we looked at the peri-implant um, uh, tissues, so very much focused this time on the periodontal aspect. Um, Today's session uh, should be, uh, is actually now streamed on Facebook. So we overcome the, the little technical issue. So that's good. It's also recorded. Um, during the entire session, feel free to ask questions uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A app at the top of your screen. We will take the questions at the end uh, of the presentation uh, one by one. Um, I will first uh, uh, present our uh, keynote speaker today, and then I will uh, gladly uh, hand over uh, and, and leave you the stage. So, Professor Friedman, um, well known now. Uh, um, you were uh, from 1994 to 2008, uh, assistant and res senior research representative at the Department of Periodontology at the Charité Medical Faculty uh, College of Dentistry. Um, then in 2008, you did your PhD about augmenting and maintaining alveolar um, bone around dental implant in patients with a history of periodontitis. So this is very much the topic of the day. Um, so great specialist here. Uh, since 2008, um, you are an ITI fellow and speaker, specialist in periodontology with the German Association of uh, Periodontology. And you're also uh, on the local chamber of the, the German Dental Society. You're also since then specialist in the field of implantology with the German Association of uh, Implantology. From 2008 to 2010, you have been a senior research representative at uh, Charité Universitet Médecine Berlin, the Department of Operative Dentistry, Endodontics, and Periodontology. Since 2010, you're full-time professor, chair, and head of the Department of Periodontology in the same university. And one year later, you um, led, uh, you are since then leading the postgraduate three-year program at this university. So I think I, uh, summed up your, your very uh, expert profile in, in periodontology. I'm uh, very glad to uh, uh, give you the stage, even though it's just virtual. Um, so I will let you take the lead. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, uh, dear Alexandra. And uh, here we go. I'm sharing my screen with you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and presenting my CV uh, to the audience, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board. I'm glad and uh, pleased to have you with us for about an hour uh, on this journey um, regarding the potential of HA in regenerative periodontal uh, tissues around teeth. So this is our topic and uh, to set up the stage, I would like to uh, share with you some uh, questions, some concerns. We probably all um, experience uh, thinking about GTR treating uh, very compromised or periodontally compromised teeth, such as uh, where are the key factors for success? Is it the choice of the biomaterial? Is it a specific choice of future material or maybe of a surgical technique? So um, I think there are a lot of a lot more of concerns we can uh, list here. 
And um, <clears throat> to remind you again, on the biological principle of regeneration as we are talking about today goes back to uh, differentiating uh, the kind of healing process which uh, we are accounting for uh, in these defects in uh, such a treatment approach. So we don't want to have the epithelial downgrowth into our uh, uh, infrabony defects um, because it would prevent uh, the new attachment formation by itself and uh, <clears throat> it uh, may but also prevent the resorption and ankylosis of the uh, roots itself but it uh, really stops uh, the regeneration the new attachment uh, formation so far uh, the gingival connective tissues we like also to exclude from the defect because uh, these fibers do not attach properly to the root surface. They do not represent uh, the attachment apparatus in uh, the way we want it to be there or to regenerate. Also, we don't want to have a direct contact between the newly built, uh, newly formed alveolar bone um, because it may cause uh, resorption and ankylosis and uh, these both uh, healing uh, pathways are really unlikely uh, for uh, tooth maintenance. <clears throat> what we are accounting for is really uh, the formation of periodontal ligament with the new cementum formation ahead. And um, so uh, the inserting collagen fibers which we are missing because of the periodontal disease, periodontitis uh, and inflammatory process should be um, regained. So the um, AP meeting 19, back 1992 already gave this definition. Uh, so they defined the periodontal regeneration as a re reproduction or reconstitution of a lost or injured uh, injured part uh, of the periodontium. And uh, looking at it uh, from the histological uh, perspective, we account for new cementum, new ligament and bone, increasing the functional support and the restitutio ad integrum. And uh, <clears throat> we don't want to end up with a long junctional epithelium. So far, I think it is well known, um, but uh, our round uh, table, we are uh, 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 meeting regularly at Florence with the uh, experts in the field uh, likes to uh, remind uh, the colleagues to back to on this on this uh, um, basic uh, definitions for uh, regenerative treatment. Uh, looking at uh, our patients at our risk assessments, we have uh, to consider that we have to deal with very different kind of patients uh, and uh, also with a lot of uh, various risks in these patients regarding our uh, expectable outcomes. So we have to really differentiate between local risks, behavioral and systemic risks, but we can work with the patient, we can develop the situation we can develop uh, the patient, prepare the patient step by step, and uh, finally achieve more or less optimal case, well-controlled case to uh, later on uh, perform surgery and surgical um, procedures in, a, in an optimized situation. It uh, relates to the smoking, um, habit, for example, it uh, also relates to any kind of compliance of the patient, also to black control uh, of the patient, stress situation, and so far and so on. <clears throat> so um, I think that, um, first of all, uh, the probability and reliability in GTR treatment or regenerative treatment in general uh, goes ahead uh, along with the uh, really well-controlled patient-related related factors. Um, 
it goes along with meticulous diagnosis and determination of the patient's phenotype with matching the phenotype with the surgical approach, with the choice of um, the procedure of the technique we apply uh, for regenerative treatment. And also we, it goes along with surgical skills, surgical approach, the choice of microsurgical instruments and so on. So, and once we follow all these pathways, we may achieve this result I share with you in this particular case uh, in a regular, on a regular level. <clears throat> so Colex, uh, very well known uh, periodontists uh, cited here in the, on this slide and um, defined uh, that we really or ruled out, I can tell, uh, that we have to adapt our approach, our surgical strategy to the phenotype of the patient. In cases where we do have a wide interdental space, uh, we can act in a different way uh, than in a narrow space where we don't have uh, a lot of space between the teeth in the interdental area where the papilla are really small and narrow. And there we have to choose another approach in our incision technique, in our flap uh, formation, and um, uh, also certainly in uh, the choice of our materials. <clears throat> so you see this schematic drawing, which uh, finally shows you different uh, possibilities. And uh, looking from the historical standpoint, uh, we can follow these line. Uh, uh, first, uh, the original papilla preservation technique was suggested, proposed by Takai in the middle of uh, 1980s. It was uh, later on modified uh, towards modified papilla preservation flap. Um, later on, uh, there was a proposal for tissue maintenance interproximal. Uh, it was followed by a simplified papilla preservation flap and also by microsurgical approach. And um, in this chronology, uh, we have to adapt our skills, our um, um, and Ambition, ambitions and also our approach to every single individual situation. We talked already about uh, different uh, flap designs in an abbreviated way uh, here assigned as MPPT or SPPF, for example. But uh, finally, uh, looking uh, downwards in this uh, slide, we have also to decide which kind of biomaterials we should uh, apply uh, or should um, prefer in one or another uh, case and situation. So um, either we go with a bone uh, grafts with a resorbable barrier or we go um, with a amelogenins or just by a resorbable barrier alone all these um, techniques and uh, materials deserve, of course, uh, flap closure, flap uh, management, and uh, different uh, strategies in uh, suturing uh, the flap and adapting the <coughs> flap margins. Briefly, we don't use that much this uh, kind of uh, yeah, ext extensive incisions. So we try to reduce the number of uh, releasing incisions and uh, preferably don't use any of uh, vertical incisions at all. But <clears throat> we rather look forward to um, leave the papilla in place and uh, do this modified or uh, papilla preservation flaps or simplified papilla preservation flaps. So if you need to increase the flap mobility, prefer 
rather horizontal extension against any vertical releasing incisions. And uh, looking into the literature, um, you may all know uh, that there is a 10 year outcome of an RCT study published last year by uh, Paolo Cortellini. And uh, looking at uh, the uh, cases have been, uh, which were done more than 10 years before, back 10 years from uh, the publication, um, the outcome showed that 88% uh, of teeth treated by uh, regenerative uh, principles survived the, this period. And looking at a complication-free survival rate uh, in comparison to the uh, other group uh, where the teeth, the uh, really compromised uh, hopeless teeth have been uh, removed and replaced by any um, other uh, treatment strategy. And the complication-free survival rate uh, was really comparable during these 10 years. So far, uh, the practical uh, consideration, the practical conclusion uh, from the paper was uh, the periodontal regeneration is the treatment of choice for compromised teeth with deep vertical infrabony defects. Um, more research is uh, still um, required, of course, regarding the uh, <clears throat> retainment and uh, maintenance of hopeless teeth. Here are some data from this publication. So the 10 year survival uh, was uh, in the regeneration uh, group somewhat less than in the group of the replaced teeth, but looking at uh, the complication free statistics, we see that the Kaplan-Meier curves for both groups are very, very similar. And uh, the final uh, result uh, after 10 years was really more or less alike in both groups. But much more interesting is this table from the publication, which shows us uh, that the attachment level gain achieved once after the surgical phase of treatment uh, within the first year of observation will be maintained over the period of the following 10 years, almost without any change, the <laughs> residual probing depth situation will remain more or less the same throughout the 10 year period. And the tooth prognosis you see has been really effectively change, changed by the successful uh, regenerative treatment in this group of patients. So um, it gives us, uh, I think, an idea how uh, predictive uh, our treatment concept may be if we really follow all the guidelines and recommendations um, established by the experts in the recent decades. So uh, these key principles looking at the local side, looking at the defect uh, directly, <clears throat> having, uh, keeping in mind all uh, things I told before, are uh, <clears throat> about the site protection, the space maintenance and stabilization of blood clot in within the defect area to uh, enable the uh, regenerative process within the stabilized blood clot well protected by soft tissue and maybe uh, some in other biomaterials. So, um, Clearly is the point, if the blood clot stability fails, the regeneration fails automatically. So recently um, published uh, treatment uh, guidelines uh, from uh, the EFP, which is available for everyone, uh, recommends um, in uh, the approach, uh, approaching the uh, infrabony residual defects, uh, it clearly states, you see it on the 
diagram on the right hand, right -hand side of, of the screen, uh, the regenerative surgery. Uh, and there <clears throat> it um, determines uh, the kind of pockets, the infrabony pockets, which should be addressed. Uh, it recommends uh, also the choice of flap. It also recommends the choice of biomaterials. And as biomaterials, uh, you see on this diagram, the barrier membranes with or without bone derived grafts and also enamel matrix derivatives with or without bone derived grafts. Well, the rationale is given here. Uh, according to the published data, we see that uh, the, using the biomaterials and using applying this um, regenerative concept, we uh, can account uh, for more regeneration, for more regenerative outcome um, in terms of additional um, attachment gain uh, compared with open flap debridement. And uh, either using the enamel matrix derivative or using the membranes uh, as a GTR technique, we have always about 1.5, 1.4 millimeter additional attachment gain. Well, <clears throat> again, looking at uh, the recommendations by the group of experts, uh, it's the choice between uh, the anatomy and uh, the local situation, uh, which kind of biomaterials should be implicated. So looking at the question, is there any key biomaterial for the best regenerative outcome? I would say uh, not necessarily. It depends on very many local factors, uh, which preference uh, you give to everyone. It may be a combination between a membrane and hyaluronic acid. It may be a membrane by itself. It may be a combination of um, graft material plus HA, hyaluronic acid. It may be enamel matrix derivative by itself without any additives. It may be a combination of a membrane with autogenous bone chips and the membrane may be either synthetic one, uh, degradable or collagen membrane, uh, which is of course bioresorbable. Now I would like to uh, share with you some uh, very specific traits of uh, hyaluronic acid. It is well known being an antioxidant, uh, hygroscopic uh, vis vis viscoelastic, uh, having a bacteriostatic effect. Uh, it is very well biocompatible. It works and functions anti-inflammatory and anti oedematous And of course it has non-antigenicity by itself. I recently discovered this very interesting paper uh, published 2013 from a group uh, from Rochester by a group from Rochester. And they looked into this naked moo rat. It is very specific uh, rodent animal living somewhere in Eastern Africa. And uh, these rodents are famous for becoming very, very old. They uh, live under lab conditions uh, in the general, uh, between uh, their uh, lifespan expands over 25 years, almost to 30 years. And these animals do not develop any cancer. And the group of researchers uh, was asking themselves why these animals are getting that old without getting any cancer disease. And obviously what they came up with was uh, the finding that very different tissues beginning from the skin and uh, up to the heart tissues, uh, the very different tissues uh, will express a, a high amount of uh, high molecular weight HA throughout the lifespan of this mole rat. And in comparison to other uh, animals like mice or guinea pigs, uh, the, the tissues really behave very, very different 
and uh, have this uh, permanent expression of HA, which obviously contributes somehow to protecting these tissues from becoming cancer. Now back to our um, choice in the oral cavity in our uh, surgical approach, um, taking a, having a look at the product, uh, Hyde and BG. It is uh, by itself, the hyaluronic acid is a key element of the human body. Uh, it is a part of extracellular matrix and uh, it binds water and allows the transport of key metabolites. So um, it uh, does uh, uh, support uh, the um, regenerative uh, healing, regenerative um, processes. It attracts blood and stabilizes uh, the blood uh, coagulum, supporting the tissue regeneration, supporting the angiogenesis, neogenesis. It is bacteriostatic by itself. It attracts uh, growth factors and coordinates also the inflammatory process. So uh, it has a lot of uh, very positive effects in very different kind of tissues. And uh, it takes too long to uh, tell you all uh, these details, but it is a very intriguing and promising uh, material. We do know that uh, there are differences uh, in the body response to a low and high weight HA, while the low molecular weight HA triggers an, an inflammatory response by increasing TNF alpha um, expression, the high weight, the high molecular weight HA reduces inflammatory response by decreasing the TNF alpha expression in the tissues. So the Hyden BG as a product uh, contains uh, mainly um, cross-linked HA in a certain uh, concentration. It is uh, of synthetic origin, so it is free of uh, endotoxins. It's actually considered to being vegan. It has a certain resorption time. Um, and um, looking into the experimental um, outcomes uh, results, there is a study which has been done uh, with both uh, formulations, the uh, light weight and uh, the high weight uh, uh, HA. And uh, uh, PDL cells actually were used for <clears throat> this in vitro experiment um, being seeded on uh, the uh, slides of uh, dentin, on dentin discs. And um, the outcome showed that um, the uh, high weight um, height and BG demonstrated uh, surfaces with more roughened surface topography and the presence of uh, cross uh, linked pattern found uh, on dentin surfaces and the cells uh, which were seeded on it showed that um, these uh, the cells seeded on the height and BG, the uh, high weight molecular weight uh, HA uh, were more elongated and uh, uh, in shape and with more spreading on these dental discs compared to controls without uh, high dent uh, treatment, without coating, and also to the uh, low molecular uh, weight uh, HA on the other hand. Looking into preclinical studies, uh, very recently published uh, by the group of uh, Tony Skulian, um, they looked uh, actually on, at the effect of uh, hyaluronic acid in uh, this kind of surgically created defects on uh, the Beagle's canine. And here the conclusion was that uh, the data indicated that the application of HA in conjunction with CF, the, the coronal advanced flap technique, promoted periodontal wound healing and regeneration in such kind of defects. And the use of HA with, uh, together with uh, CA, uh, CAF technique may represent a novel model to, um, in treating recession defects. The other uh, preclinical study looked at uh, the HA effect in an acute created 
two ball infra bony defect in also Beagle model. And here, looking at, into the, at the table, into the data that you know, the group presented, um, we have to consider that the application of um, HA, either together with a carrier, with a collagen matrix, or even without a carrier, results in a very nice outcome regarding the new cementum formation, the new cementum length, and also in the in your attachment gain in length and also even in the new bone. So um, of course, we'll, there is a need of well, confirmation of these histologically evaluated outcomes in a clinical uh, situation. <clears throat> in, in the clinic, we do have, meanwhile, this um, RCT study, which overlooks uh, post-op period of 24 months. This is a group uh, from Andrea Piloni from Roma, uh, who did uh, this RCT study uh, applying um, by chance, by random, either uh, the hyaluronic acid or enamel matrix derivative in uh, an infrabony vertical defect, as you can tell from the images, the clinical and the radiographic images shown on the left-hand side of the screen. So looking into the data, we see that uh, in regard to the percentage in, uh, in clinical attachment gain, we hardly see a um, difference between these two bioactive materials. Uh, looking into at the residual probing death, the percentage of the residual probing death uh, maybe favors a little bit the uh, enamel matrix derivative. And looking into the recession onset increase, um, again, uh, there is a slight, maybe a slight benefit, a slight uh, preference uh, for EMD. But nevertheless, uh, and these results demonstrate that uh, HA obviously has a very, very pronounced potential in supporting the periodontal healing. Let's uh, look um, into our cases. So the common denominator, uh, the denominator in all these cases is the participation of HA, of Hyden BG, uh, applied either alone or um, together with very different additional biomaterials. So a case of my collaborator and um, former resident, uh, Dr. Jung, shows here a patient uh, within an SPT visit. Um, it was uh, planned to uh, open up the site because of persistent uh, probing depth uh, equals uh, eight millimeters in depth. And uh, he decided then to use in this uh, infra, infra bony uh, defect, uh, additionally, the Hyden BG, after he instrumented, of course, the root surface by hand instruments and <clears throat> applying the suture, he um, delivered some Hyden BG gel into the defect. And also after closing the flap, he additionally applied some high, uh, higher than BG on top and inside the pocket, the residual pocket. And uh, looking at the outcome uh, six months later, we see uh, we have a residual probing depth, which does not exceed uh, three millimeter in depth. And even <clears throat> comparing the baseline X-ray to the recent one um, taken recently after six months post-op, we can tell that maybe some uh, bone consolidation uh, occurs. It is difficult to tell exactly what is going on. It is way too early. It's just uh, an idea uh, that uh, it may improve step by step. And of course, we should wait longer to take uh, another X-ray to uh, compare. So, um, my own idea was that HA 
can contribute if we combine some uh, treatment modalities with a J application. So that's why uh, I show uh, share now cases which have been done by me myself and um, where I used uh, uh, different combinations uh, between biomaterials and hyaluronic acid, uh, especially in next in the next in this upcoming case, the interdental space was really narrow. So I considered that in this situation, uh, use of a membrane uh, will uh, can be beneficial, uh, does not contribute to the <clears throat> improvement of the outcome. The initial probing depth uh, were about seven to eight millimeters in this uh, mandibular molar um, with a positive bleeding on probing, as you can tell. And um, so we decided to do regenerative treatment using the uh, synthetic graft material, Ozopia, which is uh, calcium phosphate and beta to calcium phosphate together with hyaluronic acid. So we mixed it uh, on the tray and applied uh, this uh, kind of sticky bone uh, preparation <clears throat> into the defects without using any additional barrier or membrane and uh, closed uh, the flap completely like this uh, with a specific mm -hmm. kind of suture and uh, monitoring the post-op healing you, you see in the process of healing is uneventful um, without complications looking later on uh, at 12 months outcome. Clinically, we see the probing depths are reduced down to three millimeters or less without any bleeding tendency, either on the buccal or on the lingual aspect of the tooth. And <clears throat> looking at the X-ray documentation, you see at the beginning baseline shows us uh, a deep infrabonic, quite open uh, configuration of infrabonic component in this case. Uh, in the middle, you see the post-op periapical control, where of course we can uh, recognize some graft material inside uh, the uh, infrabonic defect. And one year post-op control shows us very nice, uh, nicely regenerated sites, uh, distal and mesial of this molar. So um, <clears throat> in this case, in, the, in this previous case, uh, some uh, synthetic graft material uh, was applied and so, so far and we saw on the x-ray uh, that uh, we could uh, differentiate the participating material in the area of the defect. Now I prefer even to don't using the graft material because um, then once we do have some positive uh, result uh, from the radiography um, so we have to consider that uh, really the regeneration occurred in regard to at least the bone component but uh, if we do see some periodontal space between the root and this, uh, the bone we have to consider that uh, the regeneration of clinical attachment has uh, been taking place. So in this case, uh, for example, the tooth, uh, the first uh, premolar has been treated previously with an enamel matrix derivative and uh, some xenograft a uh, couple of years before. And the treatment uh, was successful for the um, mesial aspect of the molar, but it failed in the infrabony defect at the premolar on the distal aspect. So that's why we had uh, to retreat this one. And in this, the second time uh, I took uh, the, you know, uh, the hyaluronic acid by itself uh, and combined it with a matrix barrier, which was placed on top of the defect. And this was the outcome one year later, radiographically. And I think here we can really tell uh, from the X-ray image uh, that uh, obviously the new bone formation and also 
some uh, new um, attachment uh, were formed successfully. That's how the site looks like clinically at this moment. Well, <clears throat> saying this, I continue now um, in my cases uh, with uh, using this uh, same, the same combination, just applying HA into the defect and uh, covering the defect by the membrane. Um, and really uh, my favorite uh, choice uh, for this kind of um, treatment was uh, till uh, last year, <clears throat> actually the Guido barrier, the matrix barrier, which is not available any longer at Europe because uh, the company did, decided to, to uh, do not uh, to, to, to stop the uh, <clears throat> distribution in Europe. So uh, we have to look for alternatives today, but uh, the cases have been done. I would like love to share with you the outcome because you see in this case, you can really make up your choice, which kind of treatment do you prefer? And um, this is the defect extension. So it's uh, almost one wall defect uh, extended from the buckle to the palatal aspect of the tooth. Of course, we have uh, to thorough degranulate and to, to um, scale the surface by hand instruments. I'm uh, old fashioned, old school. I do uh, all scaling by hand instruments. And uh, then of course, you may prefer to have some filler, some uh, grafting material there. I love to uh, avoid any. And uh, so I place the HA into the defect. Uh, this is the, the barrier preparation and the application of the barrier. Uh, the um, beauty of it, uh, uh, it goes also towards uh, the integrated suture, which can be adapted around the roots of the adjacent teeth. And so uh, this barrier is really a stable and uh, stabilized in uh, place without having additional support by any filling material. So uh, then of course uh, we achieve uh, the uh, complete closure by soft tissue along with the CAF technique with the uh, Coronal advanced uh, flap um, reposition using specific uh, suture techniques uh, for stabilization of the flap, for adaptation of the flap. Um, the two weeks post op situation shows us uh, very uh, mature uh, soft tissues, primary closure, and uh, primary epithelization without any complications, without dehiscencies. <clears throat> we check the tooth mobility, uh, we clean up uh, the area and remove the sutures. Uh, 12 months post-op control shows us a significant reduction in probing depth. Um, we have uh, almost no additional um, recession from the beginning on and uh, the radiograph on the right hand side of the screen shows us a very nice uh, documented uh, bone gain, and uh, we can assume also that uh, there are uh, also a nice portion of uh, newly formed uh, clinical attachment there. <clears throat> Looking from the incisor, uh, inci incisal uh, perspective, we can also observe that uh, 12 month situation gained somehow the volume in the, of the alveolar ridge. And remember, we did not apply any additional material. It was just the membrane and a chain. So uh, there must been, have been something going on there underneath. Here, for this specific case, I have a three-year follow-up. Uh, I recorded it recently. There is a stable situation uh, regarding the soft tissue situation, uh, the, the stable regarding the probing depth, and also looking at the radiography, uh, we can really tell uh, it has even improved after the first one year looking at this X-ray past three years. 
Another similar situation, quite hopeless, uh, looking at the CBCT scan uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side and uh, looking on the right-hand side uh, at the one-year outcome, we see the probing depth uh, is reduced down to three millimeters and the radiograph, the periapical radiograph shows uh, almost complete resolution of this infrabony defect around this tooth and this tooth stabilization is warranted for next uh, decades, I assume. Uh, looking in this case at the posts uh, with this uh, provisional, uh, acrylic provisional uh, fixed partial uh, construction framework, uh, we have to consider that in this case, we really deserve uh, additional um, attachment gain. Otherwise, uh, the prognosis of, the bo of both teeth, of both, uh, both posts will be really in trouble. Look at the extension of the defects, uh, the premolar, look at the infrabony component and also the extension of the bony defect. And uh, here again, uh, we treated it applying the barrier, the guido barrier and the higher than BG gel underneath. On the other hand side, uh, the molar has also uh, a deep defect on the mesial aspect. You see the infrabony component and you see also the syringe for applying the gel into the infrabony uh, defect and the adaptation of the uh, barrier membrane with the suture to uh, secure, to adapt uh, the barrier around the root trunk of the smaller. Again, no filler, no um, graft material uh, participated here. This suture is applied, uh, the tensionless uh, closure is achieved. The primary healing was uncomplicated and a six months evaluation discloses a reduced probing depth of uh, three to four millimeters at the premolar at the molar and uh, 18 months X-ray control uh, shows unambiguous bone gain uh, considering the non-grafted defect situation on both teeth. So um, I think it is quite impressive here to see how uh, bone component and the periodontal ligament responds to the application of HA. <clears throat> um, another animal experiment showed us uh, that uh, HA applied subcutaneously together with the collagen matrix slows down uh, the uh, degradation process, especially in diabetic kind of animal in the diabetic group, because um, it, is, it has been uh, previously shown that uh, diabetic uh, rat degrades uh, uh, collagen materials much rapidly um, in comparison to a healthy animal and uh, if uh, you combine now uh, the collagen material with the HA, obviously HA protects this collagen from a uh, rapid uh, forced uh, disintegration uh, degradation process and uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, time for resolving this collagen, for degradating, uh, degrading this collagen equals uh, or comes alike the period uh, of stability in a healthy animal. So uh, keeping this in mind, I want to introduce the smart brain material. This is a collagen um, membrane uh, of uh, porcelain pericardium with a certain uh, uh, time period time of stability. Uh, the resorption takes eight to, uh, eight to 12 weeks. And uh, so uh, this is the cross section of uh, this membrane and uh, looking at the histological uh, pattern of uh, integration, we see it is nicely integrated into the 
right, muscle, and uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of blood vessel formation within the body of the membrane within uh, two weeks. Uh, and um, so it is uh, very biocompatible and uh, really excellent uh, for uh, um, the membrane effect. In, uh, in so far, I uh, um, tried uh, also once to apply the combination of uh, calcium phosphate, uh, phosphate and beta calcium uh, phosphate mixed uh, and uh, hydrated with the hyaluronic acid gel and this collagen membrane. This is the case. Uh, we did the MPPT technique again. Uh, we reflected the papilla to the palatal aspect. You see the infrabony component equaling uh, or exceeding six millimeter in depth uh, on the second molar in the maxilla. And uh, here we applied the, the graft, the posing xenograft and uh, the smart brain membrane. <clears throat> Looking at the x-rays 12 months later, we see almost complete resolution of the infrabony component on the right-hand side and the uh, previous deep infrabony uh, defect uh, was resolved more or less completely, uh, resulting in a three millimeter probing depth uh, after 12 months. So another animal experiment uh, showed us uh, that uh, if we combine the uh, cross-linked collagen scaffold with a uh, hidden BG in a kind of buccal tunnel under the soft tissue, the outcome uh, after two months will be uh, will result in uh, new bone formation at the interface between the original uh, jaw bone from the maxilla of this beagle animal and uh, the applied uh, cross-linked uh, matrix uh, hydrated with high dent BG, but also looking into the residual applied collagen material, we uh, consider that uh, within the layers of collagen, we see new bone formation islands of uh, 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 a positionally grown bone with a very nicely uh, enclosed cells inside and also lining cells on the outside of these mineralized portions of new uh, newly formed tissues. So uh, uh, looking at uh, the very extended uh, situations like uh, following a case, <clears throat> we um, still may uh, consider that uh, we can do uh, some uh, improvement to this uh, really hop hopeless tooth. In this case, we combine the treatment, uh, the periodontal uh, regenerative treatment with the posterior to it, um, procedure of uh, sinus floor elevation. So we had the access to the tooth and also in the posterior area to the autogenous bone, which we uh, sampled during the lateral window for the sinus grafting. And this autogenous bone was applied um, in the deeper portion of this infrabony defect at the second premolar. It, the premolar, the tooth was stabilized uh, by uh, splinting to the other premolar um, with a composite uh, for uh, mechanical stabilization and immobilization of the tooth. And um, on top of the autogenous bone, we use the smart, gra smart graft as a xenograft uh, to fill up uh, the space, covering uh, the site with this cross-linked uh, collagen membrane. <clears throat> The smart graft material was also uh, applied for sinus graft uh, posterior to the tooth and uh, hydration was achieved with the hyaline BG for both applications for uh, uh, the periodontal defect for infrabony defect, but also for the sinus grafting. And the X-ray six months uh, post of taken uh, uh, preparing the situation for the uh, implant placement in the area of sinus graft, uh, we see that uh, the 
periodontal defect was completely resolved. The, this tooth uh, was previously uh, endodontically treated and the endodontic treatment is uh, obviously very uh, well done and uh, we don't have any probing depths uh, exceeding three millimeters, no bleeding on probing around the tooth. And uh, <clears throat> placing the implant, we decided to re-entry to open up uh, the flap up to the tooth surface to demonstrate that uh, the, the previous defect is completely filled up at the crestal level with the newly found tissues. So that's how the site looked like after the implant was inserted and the site was closed and the X-ray control shows us uh, the implant in place. So uh, coming to the end, I would like to share with you the most recent case I did at the beginning of this year. So I could uh, this week document the four months uh, results, which is definitely intermediate and not the final result but I decided to share it with you because also this tooth uh, may be considered as a very hopeless uh, terminal situation. Still, um, it was a, a referred to me by a private periodontist. Um, the practitioner, private practitioner splint already the tooth and uh, together uh, with me, uh, we considered uh, the endodontic treatment uh, necessary for the tooth previously to the surgical um, periodontal treatment. And after the endodontical uh, treatment was completed, <clears throat> I opened up the flap. You see the extension of the defect, huge, very open defect uh, category, very deep going up to the apex of the tooth. Of course, uh, we degranulate um, thoroughly the site, we clean up the wood surface, and um, then I apply again the matrix barrier. You see it on the right hand side. In this case, I decided to use not only HA, but also to give some additional support to the barrier by the filler. I uh, use the Ozopia, the synthetic. Uh, material hydrated with hydrant BG in this case, because um, the bony peaks uh, were not enough to uh, give a, a safe support to the barrier on my mind. So that's why I used uh, additionally this graft um, material and um, placed and adapted uh, the barrier on top of it, as you can see, on the center image uh, of this uh, on this screen, and uh, afterwards, of course, complete flap closure was achieved by uh, means of uh, coronal advanced uh, technique and uh, the specific sutures. Um, the monitoring of the healing shows us uneventful uh, process within the first week after five weeks, and now uh, four months later. And in this situation, I decided even to check the probing. And you see clinical probing at four months um, recorded here shows us um, either uh, depths uh, of two millimeters, three maybe at most on the palatal aspect of four millimeters depth. You remember the extension of the defect and looking at the X-ray and uh, we compare the situation uh, between baseline and now um, after four months. Of course, it is way too early uh, for an X-ray. Just for today's session, I decided to document uh, the current status. And you see that uh, the situation looks really very, very promising as from the top clinically, as also uh, in terms of radiographic outcome. So I calculated just because of this uh, recent case, um, I uh, included into these uh, numbers here. Um, I share now the uh, outcomes observed uh, within four and more months. Um, other 14 calculated cases or included cases here into this uh, gross calculation uh, <clears throat> were observed for at least 12 months. So we um, 
among my own pa patients and cases, there are 15 from a uh, total of 25 from uh, done by our department. Uh, we see uh, problem depth reduction equaling uh, 5.7 millimeters. The range is given in, in brackets uh, right to the means. Uh, the mean attachment level gain equals 4.9 millimeters and uh, gingival recession equals 1.2 millimeters. Uh, so uh, this uh, relates to just 15 patients uh, who I did myself. You may raise the question, how is about uh, the non-surgical application of HA? And uh, yes, uh, there are studies uh, running today. There are some um, case reports uh, shared by uh, our colleagues already. And uh, I must uh, tell uh, if uh, we go with a non-surgical application of HA, we have to also to use or consider useful the uh, implementation of chloramine gel uh, before we apply the hyaluronic acid gel. The um, chloramine gel is a perisol. It is a two component gel for uh, <clears throat> uh, resolution of biofilm. So um, it has been shown uh, as very effective um, against uh, the biofilm, subgingival biofilm with uh, gram negatives and uh, very uh, well known uh, participants uh, uh, of uh, putative periopathogens. And uh, uh, the two components uh, are required to combine the hypochlorite solution with um, amino acids uh, for protecting surrounding adjacent healthy tissues from the effect of hypochlorite in the area in the site. So, uh, uh, in so far, this combination has been shown in vitro being really very, very uh, biocompatible with the cells, uh, uh, the uh, eukaryotic cells, which were seeded after the treatment of, with chloramine gel on uh, titanium surfaces, and they uh, performed really very well. Looking at the um, outcomes using the chloramine gel as an adjunct to the ultrasonic debridement, for example, here we see we have a study from uh, by the group of Monbelli published uh, a year ago, something uh, they showed a trend uh, that uh, the combination of ultrasonic debridement and chloramine gel uh, was a little bit better in uh, reducing the residual probing depths. And I know if uh, not all pockets uh, have been calculated, but the deepest uh, one uh, would be um, selectively calculated, the difference uh, would become uh, significant, statistically significant. And it was uh, significant in reducing the T. falsitia and T. denticola counts um, after seven days and four months after treatment. So uh, looking at the non-surgical uh, protocol, we uh, use the chloramine gel first uh, to uh, follow the first application by mechanical treatment of the surface. Um, then we repeatedly apply for another 30 seconds uh, the chloramine gel, the perisol gel, and afterwards we apply uh, the higher than BG gel, the uh, hyaluronic acid, twice within one week. So the patient has to come back. And in this particular case, you see that the control visit uh, six months later shows us an improvement um, in the terms of probing depth reduction by almost three millimeter and no uh, bleeding, no uh, bleeding on probing at all after uh, uh, this pertinent and uh, continuous uh, inflam uh, inflammation in the area. And uh, <clears throat> I think you agree with me that uh, the alternative way for this tooth, for this defect would be the surgical pathway, but uh, we decided to use uh, this kind of non-surgical uh, approach first. So I conclude 
that hydrogen BG is easy to combine with other biomaterials such as membranes or, and bone grafts. HA appears to have great potential in supporting regenerative processes in infrabony periodontal defects. The effect of HA applied with, uh, within the surgical protocol is comparable with other bioactive products. And in combination with chloramine gel, it has uh, capacity in non-surgical periodontal treatment as well. And saying this, I thank you for joining us, for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to our discussion and to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, uh, fantastic presentation and all these cases covered. Uh, fascinating, I would say. Um, so please, uh, yeah, send us the, uh, the questions in the uh, Q&A uh, app or in the chat. Um, I will start maybe with the uh, um, first one. Um, I believe you covered it at the end, but so uh, would you recommend the use of AHA in a flapless manner? Uh, well, um, our database is not that, that um, big today because we started out recently uh, doing the non-surgical uh, um, combination. I think um, the results uh, we uh, observe today were overlook. Meanwhile, are promising. The problem is today I don't have enough data to differentiate to tell you which uh, defect morphology responds really well prospectively, uh, which kind of uh, situation is better to uh, treat non-surgically, uh, uh, distinguishing uh, it from others, uh, which preferably should be treated surgically. So uh, this differentiation I can't uh, do, I can't recommend. But generally, yes, uh, and meanwhile, we don't use it alone for SPT. Meanwhile, we use it also for the first uh, treatment stage uh, where we do the um, subgingival instrumentation within the active uh, anti-inflammatory treatment and in uh, certain situations and certain uh, severe defects we preferably combine the uh, scalings as in the subgingival instrumentation with the perisolve uh, application and uh, followed by HA in fact yes. Okay thank you. Um... In the EFP recommendation for periodontal defects, uh, would you consider HA as a substitute to EMD? Um, you know, the data I shared with you and our own uh, experience, clinical experience, are very, very promising. And I think one day maybe uh, uh, having uh, enough data, it uh, goes in this direction, in fact, yes. Thank you. Um, would you be able to estimate how much longer HA can extend your collagen membrane? Um, okay. Um, you know, I think, um, yes, it may extend uh, the withstanding capacity of a collagen membrane by um, combination, which has been followed also in the preclinical study I shared with you. I think applying the HA in a periodontal um, infrabony defect, we can account also for effects on the tissues, on the cells required for a regenerative process. So I consider definitely, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we do have, and these effects have been shown in vitro on uh, osteoblast-like cells, on PDL fibroblasts, in vitro, um, where we really see uh, that uh, HA has um, definitely an, uh, an effect uh, on um, the expression of, uh, for example, growth factors uh, such as uh, FGF, as um, also some uh, other uh, growth factors. Um, our lab, our in vitro experiments uh, looked at the uh, expression levels for um, bone proteins, uh, bone encoding proteins, such as uh, RANX2, osteocalcin, and so on. And we do see also there 
certain e positive effects of uh, HA presence. And uh, in so far, I consider it has a stimulating effect uh, on the cells by itself. So additionally to the prolongation of the collagen uh, resistance in the body. Okay, thank you. Um, is your site preparation with EMD done the same way with, than with HA? Well, uh, you know, generally, yes, I showed you the scheme, how we uh, consider the approach uh, necessary. And um, uh, it is not really specifically changed uh, for application of HA. So I think uh, the general um, the general formula uh, formulation how to deal with the soft tissue, how to place your incisions, are uh, generalizable. It is it is not focusing at uh, any specific material. Okay. Um, do you rinse HA? No, I don't rinse it. No, it stays there. It, uh, it, uh, I want to, to keep it in the site, in the defect, under the membrane, under the barrier, with the, with the uh, grafting material together as long as possible. What sutures are you using? Uh, well, I use uh, regularly PTFE sutures, 5.0, and uh, combine it with the uh, Thinner suture 6O, for example, either monocryl uh, or um, some uh, monophyl, monophyl suture from uh, Hufridi, for example, it's polypropylene 6O, sometimes 7O. Thank you. Uh, do you mix uh, HA with EMD? No, I never did. I never did. I don't know what will be the outcome, it, uh, it would be really experimental, I think. <laughs> I don't know any group who has been exploring this. Okay. I think I've covered them. Any other question? Okay, maybe last question for my side. Uh, yes. So in your, in your surgeries, um, would you basically uh, consider that HA could become a standard? Of course, I'm super biased, as you can see behind me, but um, <laughs> how do you see the evolution of HA? Well, I, I really do believe that uh, it becomes more and more an alternative, really. Uh, very nice, really very supportive, very positive and promising alternative to other bioactive uh, materials we have. Yeah. Cool. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Friedman. Um, I would like to, to mention that you have also no conflict of interest with the, uh, our company. So um, um, I, I see that I think we've been around all the, the questions. So um, thank you very well, much. It's um, very happy for this session with you again today. And I would like to thank also all our participants uh, today on, on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, I will leave you uh, the, the word for, for closing, if, uh, if I may. Yes, thank you very much for your interest. Uh, hope you had some insights into the promising results and uh, maybe you are confident enough now to try it on yourself, on your own. and. Uh, well, thanks for your attention and uh, goodbye. Stay safe. All the best. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.